Hi everybody, yes, I am coming to you in my pajamas. So, I've had a very interesting evening. A deer fell out of the sky while Ashley was going to pick up sushi. And I had deer fur embedded in my car. But we're, we're thinking that deer was not killed. Like, he escaped the situation. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we have some deer fur. I have no idea what its magical purpose may or may not be. Um, so then I was talking about this book, and we've been having a lively conversation here about this, and so, well, I've been having a lively conversation, they just, they're listening to me rattle on, but we were talking about, I'm talking about this book called The Conjure Woman. Now, you know, because of the way things are, um, African traditional religions, our oral traditions, most of the magic of African, uh, uh, Americans of the diaspora in this country are also oral traditions. They've been captured by people like Henry Hyatt, who did extensive research, and then he like looked at all the different stories. So that's what people want to need to know about magic. You will see certain consistencies. Like you're not supposed to read and believe everything you read in a book or everything you read on the web, you know. But just like when I was making Florida water, I went because I did not have the advantage of an oral history, nor did I have an advantage of a grandma who left a recipe book behind. So I went and started looking at all kinds of sources. I talked to people. I looked at um, older books. I looked at the Internet to find the common things that ran through uh, Florida water. And then because I studied the different magical properties, medicinal properties of plants, because Florida water is one of those all-you-can-eat spiritual cleansers, you know, all-purpose. Kind of like the Mr. Queen of Conjure, wouldn't you say that? <laughs> it's, a, it's an all-purpose, you know. People use that for a variety of reasons. Some other waters have very specific things, like lavender water is for relaxation, rose water is simply to remove negative en energies, and like my waters can be for whatever magical purpose they've been formulated. But I was kind of upset because we didn't find any books that were really primarily written by black people that we felt would fit the mission of teaching basic magical herb magic, um, either because um, they were improperly cited, like there is a book everybody uses out there, and while there's a bibliography in the back, there, it's not an MLA, it's not an APA, and I'm a scholar, I want to know where shit comes from. But there's nothing by anybody black like that. And so we faced a real battle when we were choosing the books for the Root Work 201 Intensive because that, that oral tradition. But there's an explanation for some of that, and I couldn't figure out. So we got all these books, and they were all great because they do, the magical correspondences do transfer to hoodoo. That's one thing we, we do know. Um, and so hoodoo being the use of whatever is available on the land for magical purposes, feel fairly confident in using such books. But, you know, like I said, books, history, his story. Of course there may be inaccuracies, and that's where spirit comes in. We're having a conversation here about divination. Now, if you've had a reading with me, you'll know that most of the time I'll give you your reading before a card is dealt. And people like confirmation. So... I deal the cards. Hi, everybody. Yeah, my shirt, these are my Christmas uh, pajamas, but I wear, you know, I keep Christmas in my heart mm. year-round. Shut up. <laughs> I'm just lazy. I didn't comfortable. Still cold outside. Shit. I wear some pajamas because I get pajamas every year. We all get a pajamas for Christmas, and I'll be walking around here in the middle of May if it's cold with happy holidays across my chest, and I have. No shame, Joseph. You sit there talk all that shit you want to. It's all right. So, um was greatly disturbed that I didn't really, Papa Jim's is more of, actually from an ATR perspective, but um, we don't even know if he was a person of color who wrote it. And once again, because of our oral tradition, and that's the first thing, now let's, let's talk about some other things that keep us from being um, actively involved in the commercial practice of magic and we're finding this out like right now as we try to find a place for our store um you'd be surprised how much these folks want for this shit i mean we, this dude told us sixteen hundred dollars a month but no floors and i'm and i asked joseph what the fuck does no floors mean and he's like i guess we gotta come and do the floors and of course you talk to the dude he's like oh okay how about if we throw in the floors for us i'm like dude 
we're still talking about sixteen motherfucking hundred dollars a month. Mm -mm, no, no, no. I ain't trying to go out like that, and I'm not trying to get loans from anybody because we know that the banks are run by old, rich, and most likely racist white men uh, who are very happy to keep us carpet bagging with interest and things like that. So I don't want to give them no more of my money than I already have to. Um, I think when you talk about black liberation, one of the things we need to fucking liberate ourselves from is credit. <laughs> credit cards, interest, and all that shit. Um, so I, I, I was a little vexed in my mind. I didn't tell anybody about it, but I was like, man, I, I got to find something black to frame uh, these uh, four-day intensives with. I, I'm not going to just throw books around from literally dead white men or dying white men um, like they did to me in graduate school. And once again, in graduate school, I found a way to work around that because my concentration was 20th century black female writers living in America. Um, so they always, when I took my master's comps, they could tell exactly who I was because I did a study of guilt. They would talk about, write about the theme of guilt in Hawthorne's The Seven Gables and then compare it to a work of modern American literature. And I compared it to James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. So there goes that anonymous. James Baldwin, the same, were related to Alec Baldwin. No, James Baldwin is not related to Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Actually, literally, he does this to me. He gives me what we call white people questions. Is James Baldwin related to Alec Baldwin? How come the caucasity? <laughs> the caucasity. <laughs> you haven't seen that meme, okay? And so the question constantly always comes up when it comes to Magic based on the African diaspora, the slave trade, and ATR. Yes. The question constantly, constantly comes up. Where are Europeans' place in this practice? And once again, I'm going to say to you, the, what I practice, I can't speak to what the whole world or anybody else practices, is ancestor-based. I know my ancestors did these things. I watched them do these things and wasn't, was like, oh my God, we did these things. You know, I very vividly remember my grandmother was not a worker, but she she sure talked to dead people. She sure loved her numerology, and she went to a worker. And I remember being scared, pissless, sitting on the west side, and there was one in every apartment building. That's what my mother-in-law told me. But my, my mother's apartment building on West Washington in Chicago, sitting in there with the original Elizabeth Roof. Now, back in my day, you got your ass beat if you made noise, Okay. So I was scared anyway because you had beads and smoke and incense and candles and shit. And my ass was sitting in the corner for real. I talk a lot, but I shut the fuck up that day. And I couldn't hear as much as I tried off no good shit what they were talking about. But they were talking about things in hushed tones. There's a whole bunch of family folklore about a curse that we've had and other things that um, probably was the reason why she went there. Um, but, uh, you know, we... We have that way of saying, you know, and, you know, some people uh, that are not black have those things as well. What you're going to find is the people from the lowest social economic levels were people who practiced this magic. And one of the things that I found out in, in reading just the introduction, I read this book, who we're not going to talk about how long ago I read this book, but you can, you can see the cover, so you can guess that it is over 20 years old. And one of the things that the book said is that the universe, it's, it's a low, I almost lost y'all, sorry about that, if somebody's reaching for shit, yeah, I'm talking about you. So anyways, one of the things that, um, I just got completely thrown off. One of the things about the Conjure Woman is yes, that yes, yes. The, she is a woman. No, shut <laughs> up, just shut up. Because you're not helping matters. I can't stand it. I hate his soul. He does this every day to me, y'all. He does this weird Las Vegas, um, like, National Geographic narrator voice. It's fucking crazy. And then he says the strangest things. <laughs> Anyways, the reason um, that I that really inspired the conversation that made me go live was there is a part in the book that talks about black people's connection to nature. And um, how in this book, the narrator was a white man, he was a businessman, and his wife was his wife, but he would never get the bigger picture of the story. He would always look at the conjuration part of the story and discount it, but the wife would get to the heart of the matter of the story and be like, no, this is about 
a couple that can't be together because the husband's so, such a good worker, he keeps being passed around from plantation to plantation. Or, so they make him into a tree. And then all of a sudden, because he's such a beautiful tree, they want to cut him down and, and, and mill him. And she can't get to him in time to break the spell because they turned him into a tree. They conjured. But it is very interesting um, about a couple of things. Um, they talk about, in these stories, Chestnut evo evokes a strong sense of discreteness between the world of black and white. The slaves may re uh, result to occult powers to help them overcome particular difficulties. But the white man's arbitrary power is stronger and more destructive than any goofer. Now, when you stop to think about that, um, and, they, and it goes on to say, which is why I, I felt it important to talk to you guys about this book and why you should read it. It says, the slave may call upon the trees, the birds, the animals, and even the seasons to help him. But he has no ultimate defense against the master's legal and economic power. It determines his life and death at the white man's whim. With this knowledge, Julius gains power, but not the economic and social power. John can take for granted his whiteness, but the power over more, in, but but not the power over more intimate and mysterious secrets of life itself. So when you start to think about African spirituality, when you even really start to think about root work, you know. Um, there is this connection to nature that is necessary. Um, some of the oldest stuff, you know, that was not very kind to animals <laughs> involved uh, doing certain things with animals. And, 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 but see, today, so you've got that, that distance. And I say that for, for, for Europeans who did probably have, and it's been shown, their own magical practices, that separation with that economic power and the technological advances and racism that involves the, all that power separates you from nature. The more technology you get, the less, you know, you're not going to be out washing your uh, clothes in a bucket in the river. You're going to either have somebody washing them for you or you're going to, at this point, have a washing machine. So that takes you away from washing your clothes in the river. And you think about all of the symbolism to the river and people still getting baptized there and sending spell work down the river. So when you want to talk about this, what we call black girl magic, and it's not just black girl magic, um, it's, it's that connection and it's not tangible. It's not really definable. And it's also really not being used at the level it should be. And because, and that's another thing. So you've got the separation of Europeans from nature. Okay. All right. And they're, the, the further they get with technological and financial advantages, the, fur, the furthest they get away from nature, you know? So, and because, and we're talking about, we're not talking about like civilization type of advantages, intellectual type of advantages, because Africans have had those forever. And even you can go and see down in their cities, they'll put up a picture of Detroit versus a picture of a, a city in Africa. And people always think that the bust down place is in Africa and that shit would be Detroit or Los Angeles or someplace in Chicago on the west side. So um, we have the intellectual um, and making things that are very important to civilization of this day. We just were listening to a word and I'm Joseph's not here to talk to me about honey. And he said that he gave me the Yoruba word for it. I believe it was the Yoruba word. And it sounds almost exactly the same. So when you talk about, oh, it's Latin or Roman equivalent, you got to understand that the Latin and the Roman came from someplace else. Once again, you know, even if you look at it from a mythology, a biblical type of thing, everybody came from one place at one time and we dispersed. So understand that the reason race and the bias of race on upon, uh, upon your appearance is a man-made construct. But... Appearance is not. Appearance is very scientific. I learned this in physical anthropology. If you moved to a colder climate, your nose would thin out so you didn't have to get so much cold air. Your nose and your lips, that was a protection. Your hair follicles would get thinner, which means your hair would be finer and straighter because your head traps heat. Your melanin would significantly reduce 
due to the fact that you weren't in extremely hot sun. And conversely, people who were over, you know, over the equator in, in, in Africa, um, especially sub-Saharan Africa, you know, um, you're going to have more melanin. Your hair follicles are going to be wider. In fact, a lot of people who back in the day lived out in um, nomadic societies, bush societies, and certainly some, you know, static tribal societies, they all shave their heads, the men, the women. That's why you'll see in National Geographic the women don't have hair because that's like wearing a fucking helmet in the middle of a sauna. You, you don't do that. So we've got all of these appearance differences. That is science. It's evolution. It's where we live. It's how we adapt. It's natural selection. But at the same time, these socio-ecological forces take you away from animism and other older forms of spirituality. So then you get the simplified church, the simplified one God. You try to make three things one God, which is always very confusing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then if you're lucky, you get a few saints thrown in, whatever, whatever. It takes out all the complexity of any um, ancient cosmology. It just takes out all of the, just takes out all of but what those things are that were removed when they talk about pagan things is that affinity with nature. Okay? And so that's that thing you can't touch. That's that black girl magic or that black person's magic. And it's for a variety of reasons, but one of them most certainly is due to white economic and socioeconomic, white socioeconomic power. Because you can't go to the hospital because you don't have the money to pay for the hospital. So you continue the medicine and the magic and the prayers of your ancestors to heal. Um, so there's, you'll find that there are a lot of um, uh, things that are alluded to that are in conjure, but people be like, oh, no, that's a conjure. That's a home remedy, like sweet oil in your ear. Okay, things like that that people will assign to a home remedy, but... Um, it's very clear, the more that I study um, African traditional religion and the magic of my, my people, um, what I find is, is that it, 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 it still applies. Um, it still has a deep, deep, deep connection with nature. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that thing. It's that thing that you can't put your finger on, and that's why... It is so very important. I don't know if I've ever, I, I've read it before 20 years ago, but I, I, I don't know if I've ever had it understood as much as I had it in this book. And one of the things that the book discusses, I'm going to see if I can find the passage, but I think it was about the destruction of that, what that power does, okay? And so in the end, we are spiritually victorious but the destruction of that lack of affinity with nature is much more destructive and that is why it was 63 degrees in Antarctica yesterday while a whole fucking coral reef died in Australia you know why deers are falling out the fucking sky on my car instead of having a place to live you know, that, that destruction, and as they, they start to rape the EPA, um, it's so funny because even when they do want to talk about it, I remember when I was a little kid, and y'all hit like or love, if y'all remember the Native American commercial where he is standing on a cliff and he is crying because he's looking at all this damn garbage, but he was white, he was playing a Native American on the commercial. <laughs> it, I, the, 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 the fucked up in this is just not lost on me at all so you have to understand then what it's very very interesting is about the commentary on the relationship that uh the narrator's uh wife has with uncle julius who's telling these stories in the conjure woman both the narrator and his wife are northerners therefore their sympathies can be counted on as anti-slavery but as she tries to measure the impact of slavery on blacks the woman's heart reaches much further uh, Uncle Julius, sorry, that was an alarm, toward Uncle Julius' world than does the man's mind or social conscience. And I think that's one of the things about women being the bearers of life and having a womb, that she could get to the deeply disturbing emotional part, whereas this, this, this man only could see maybe the logical or the 
things that had to do with money parts or things like that. And you see that. You see that in society. Um, you know, as far as allies are concerned, I'm seeing a much stronger white female presence than I do white men. And it's it's disturbing. Um, and then, you know, but because of that influence of racism, we even have um, allies that need to be educated or shut the fuck up sometimes because they just don't understand. And that, that thing about it's a black thing, you wouldn't understand. And what's really, really, really amazing to me is that somebody will say, oh, this is all racist. Okay. Well, first of all, black people can be prejudiced. They can't be racist because racism in its truest definition, its social ecological, social economic definition is having the ability to oppress somebody through your prejudice. And that's not it. So, um, but it's not even prejudice. What it is is an extreme cognitive dissonance because what they are not understanding is just like they tried to use the black, historically black colleges and universities as an example of school choice. You, they, they, you created this. So you created the need for us to educate ourselves because you wouldn't let us in to your schools. That's, you know, when, now that we are permitted to attend such institutions, sometimes the experiences there can have such a drastic effect on your psyche that you leave with, you know, PTSD. You know, I've had my life threatened because I was Black Student Union president and I uh, protested a frat doing a blackface skit 30 years ago. You would think that 30 years later, motherfuckers would not do a blackface skit and say they didn't realize what they were doing. You know, I've had somebody burn my ID to my door and burn my face out with a cigarette at some of these institutions. So, you know, yes, that, that the Native American commercial is old as fuck. And yes, I'm almost 50 years old. So I'm, I'm, I'm spilling all the tea tonight. Because this book has really got me thinking about this, you know, and there are people that get it, but realize that we wouldn't have the Dakota Pipeline if we didn't have this pervasive oppressor who felt like that because they had the money and because they had the resources, they could take whatever they want. And that's what happens here, you know, and you have to understand that civilizations rise and fall based on that all the time. It's not just Europeans that have done this. This has been done throughout history, throughout cultures, throughout nations, throughout tribes. The human requirement for power, the human, and, I, and it's, even as a requirement, doesn't say it mean that it's good. For, and then their tendency for greed um, that comes from that. Because, you know, but then what, I, what I'm saying is all of this stuff caused a separation with nature. And then on the other side of that, you have black people who are at the extreme. You know, uh, I don't trust people that are, are scared of animals. Just, I've had people come over and just be running from my cats, jumping and shit. My cats are looking at them like, what, bitch? What do you want? You know, never been scratched by a cat. I can understand if you've been attacked by a cat or a dog. I get that, okay? But, you know, um, just that abhorrence of having an animal near you um, is, is, is very strange to me. Um, and the lack of things like, one of the things about being very, very in touch and attuned to nature is being cognizant of your surroundings. Most of us can't even remember phone numbers anymore. You know, how many times I had to, like, drill my daughter to get her to remember her address, you know, um, and that's because, once again, technology. Jesse, she, Jesse attack you, Tiffany, for real? What she do to you? Did she eat you? She bad as hell. Now, that's a crazy fucking cat. Now, that, but she's actually as crazy as that fucking cat is. She's never really hurt anybody. She likes to run up and nip on your Achilles tendon, doesn't even break the skin, and then take off running. I think that she's got a demon in her, you know, and she's fairly entertaining because of that. But yeah, um, she, you know, she's just a crazy fucking cat. Calicos. Nobody told me about female cats or calicos. And I promise you, woo-woo, I will never have either again. Because that fuck, I'm giving me a black cat next time. I'm giving me a black cat. Whole house be black. 
because this crazy mixed motherfucker is out of her mind okay the calico means that she pretty much has a little bit of everything in her and you know when that happens sometimes you get these genetic mutations and shit don't go right well that's a calico cat for you she done had all kinds of mix-ups she's 50 million 11 colors and she acts like it she displays the worst that every single trait of every single cat has to offer so i'm not surprised but most animals will not attack you and that's the thing yeah crazy spiteful bitch exactly that's exactly it. you're right yes yeah oh yeah they want you to pet them it's like what give me a greek goddess or, or, or a story like that where she's very alluring it's like the sirens she's a siren she fucking sings you that song, get you all sucky. Yeah, she's a succubus. She sings you all in, and then you touch her. And then she was like, and then she rubs against you like, love me. <laughs> Crazy. But I actually like that in her. Because that's some hardcore shit. You know, I'd be like that with a dude. Be like, oh, I love you, I love you. Go home. <laughs> I like that. That's independence. <laughs> But yeah, that is why I don't. If you don't go to the intensive, pick this up. Make sure you get one that hasn't been altered by somebody else. Um, because there's several editions out there. If you go on my website under the classes, there's the ISBN number for this book that I have, and that will lead you probably to the most. Because uh, the different people are writing introductions. I heard people have added to it or took it taken away from it because it's a series of short stories. So make sure you get. A complete one. If you want me to give you the table of contents, I will. I'll post it down here so that you make sure that your edition has all of the stories in it. But that that's basically why I signed on tonight. And I'm, I'm going to let you guys go because I'm still traumatized about the deer that fell into the fucking hood of my car. But I wasn't in it. If I had been in it, I, I'd probably be in a rubber room somewhere because that's my, my biggest fear is to hit an animal. I hit a cat once, a, a kitten, I think, and I saw the cat take off running. I'm hoping that it didn't hurt her, and she lived somewhere, but, you know, you never know. But fucking deer, and they, man, let me tell y'all, we was coming down the street. I was taking my friend Candace, one of my little witchy friends from Chicago, came to visit me for the weekend, and we went up to my hometown uh, where I grew up and, you know, did all kinds of witchcraft things, and, and Monday morning, it's like 6.30, it's still, it's like dawn, it's like that minute before the, the light, the world lights up, and I'm driving down the same fucking street in the opposite direction, and I say, who's what, in my mind, because I was, I was like, who's walking a big old, do and before dog could get out of my mouth, I realized, number one, this was not no motherfucking dog, and there was no leash or owner attached, it was a like, goddamn deer, I thought it was like a, I thought it was a Great Dane or something. I've sat and watched five of them just run through the neighborhood. They'd be sitting at the corner looking at you all in the cut. Um, I, I, and I asked my, 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 my colleagues here, would that reduce my chances for being um, running into a deer ever again? Mm -hmm. Since we've been through this once and they, they said no. So, anyways, well, that that is why um, this magic and things are important to us. Um, I'm going to probably have to get off of here in a second. But anyways, um, because <laughs> somebody else is on the phone. <laughs> anyways, I'm going to end this. But the reason why I wanted to talk to you about why this book, and I didn't realize in the very beginning, and I don't, I didn't know why Spirit told me that we had to read it, um, why it was important to this work was because of the lack of books by us about these types of things and how this book speaks to the social undercurrents not only of the time but to anybody who lives under the legacy of slavery both white and black so it's and and, and why this magic is the way it is you know people seem to think well, if this magic was so powerful why y'all still in a fucked up position that introduction of this book simply explains it you know, the magic is what sustains us. The magic is why we were able to continue to produce, to live at all. Because the level of brutality and the oppression brought on by this legal and economical power is so great. It's so great that it wipes out entire civilizations. Um, and that may be possible with ours, too. So that that over uh, concern of, of power, money, and oppression that's usually the ruin of any great society and you know more and more the reason why i wanted to talk to you about it was 
because I'm I'm reading it here in this book, and this book was written in 1885. That's 12 years before my grandfather was born, and he'd be well over 100 by now if he was still alive. Man, it's not changed. So that's why it's important. I know I'm prattling. So you all have a good night. Bye.